I wanted to make a video looking at the history of the universe, but a lot happened, so I've decided to turn it into a video series. This first video will look at just the first second, even here this is going to be an overview of what happened. I could easily do an entire video on each of the epochs I'm going to be discussing. Let's find out more. The accepted version of events is called the Big Bang, but even here there are a lot of things we don't know and a lot of potential models to explain what happened. Our current models fit the observational evidence and the mathematical models that we've constructed. But the great thing about science is that if better ideas come along, we can change our accepted models to fit any new better data. So what we know is only what we know now. Anyway, back to the early universe. And let's start at the beginning at time zero. Already we're getting into strange territory here. The Big Bang didn't happen at a point in space and time. The Big Bang happened everywhere. When we think of explosions, we think of them in a particular place. And this is a problem with the way that we tend to imagine the start of the universe. The Big Bang was an expansion of space itself. Also, we're only talking here about the visible universe. Beyond that, we really don't know. The universe may be infinite, and we may never know. So, what was happening right at the beginning? Well, we don't know. The first 10 to the minus 43 of a second, and that's a really brief period of time, is known as the Planck Epoch. And it's during this time that it's thought that the very early universe was dominated by quantum gravity. Since we don't have a working theory of quantum gravity, or supergravity as it's also known, we can't explain what was happening during this briefest of periods after the start of the universe. During the Planck Epoch, energies must have been immense, equating to a temperature of about 10 to the 32 Kelvin. And the universe was incredibly small, just 10 to the minus 35 of a metre. During this time, all four fundamental forces were combined as a single force. There are currently two leading ideas that try to explain supergravity, though none have been verified yet. And they're called string theory and loop quantum gravity. Actually, there are a number of string theories which have been merged together into something called M-theory. But string theory and loop quantum gravity are topics for a whole video themselves. During the Planck Epoch, our ideas of space and time don't really have any meaning. There's no space and no time. Well, not as we can currently explain it. The universe may have been infinitely small and infinitely dense. But outside of mathematics, infinities are not particularly useful for explaining things. Well, not until we have a model of quantum gravity. According to the Hartle-Hawking model, yes, that Hawking, the universe had no beginning in time as we understand it. It suggests that as we get close to the beginning of the universe, there's no time and only space. In the same way that we use rulers to measure space and clocks to measure time, at the beginning of the universe, our clocks become rulers. So what have we learned so far? Well, we've learned that the universe didn't start at a particular point in space, it happened everywhere, and also we've learned that it didn't have a start time. So we're doing really well so far. The next brief period of time following the start of the universe lasts from the end of the Planck epoch up to 10 to the minus 36 of a second. Still vanishingly small periods of time on a human scale, but very important to the very early universe. This next period is called the Grand Unification Epoch. At the start of this, gravity separated from the other three forces, electromagnetism, the strong and the weak force. But these other forces are still unified as a single force that we call the electronuclear force. We know that at high energies, the weak interaction and electromagnetism unify into a single electroweak force. But the energy needed to unify all three forces was truly staggering, in the region of 10 to the 15 giga electron volts. So during this epoch, the universe had a temperature of about 10 to the 27 Kelvin. To put that into perspective, the centre of our sun has a temperature of about 1.5 times 10 to the 7 Kelvin. So this is 100 billion billion times hotter. At the end of the GUT epoch, 
the strong force breaks away and becomes separate. It's thought that this event released huge amounts of energy, which led to what happened next. Inflation. Inflation occurs for only the briefest of times, only from 10 to the minus 36 of a second to 10 to the minus 32 of a second. But in this time, the universe, as it was, expands massively. It grows about 10 to the 26 times, from a size that's submicroscopic to roughly the size of a golf ball. This is somewhat equivalent to growing from the size of a grape to the size of the observable universe in a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. That's how big inflation is. Inflation also very nicely solves some of the problems that could occur with the Big Bang model. And one of these is the horizon problem. Imagine the Earth is at the centre of the universe, which from our point of view it is. If we look in one direction, there are stars for which the light has been travelling for nearly the entire age of the universe. If we look in the opposite direction, the same is also true. This means that these stars here are so far apart that they could never have been causally connected. This is because the time taken for light to travel between them is longer than the age of the universe. Since the speed of light is the ultimate speed limit of the universe, heat could never have been exchanged between these two regions of space. In theory then, there should be parts of the universe that are vastly different from each other, because they're not causally connected. However, we don't find that. The universe is remarkably similar no matter in which direction you look. Inflation solves this problem by suggesting that prior to inflation, the universe expanded much more slowly, meaning that all the parts of the admittedly very small universe were in causal connection to each other and could exchange energy so that the universe now is very similar in all directions. There's also the monopole problem and the flatness problem that inflation solves, but maybe those are for topics for a future video. But what caused inflation? Well, recent ideas suggest that it was all because of a field called the inflaton. Fields pervade all of reality, and they all have a certain amount of energy. In fact, particles are quantum fluctuations in the various fields. The inflaton field is another field that may have been responsible for this period of inflation. Before the inflation, the inflaton field was at a higher energy state. Now, things in the universe tend to want to be at the lowest energy possible. This is the reason why a ball placed on the side of a hill will roll down to the bottom. In doing so, it will achieve a lower energy state. Random quantum fluctuations in the inflaton field caused a phase transition in the movement of the field to a lower energy state. The energy that was lost was then released into the universe as energy and particles and generated a repulsive force that caused cosmic inflation. At the end of the inflation, the universe settled down into a more stable, albeit incredibly high energy state, from which our current universe developed. There have been other suggestions that a separate inflaton field isn't needed and that a modified Higgs field would actually do the same job. During inflation, the universe also supercools from a temperature of 10 to the 27 Kelvin down to a temperature of 10 to the 22 Kelvin. Inflation also partly coincides with our next time period called the electroweak epoch. In fact, in a lot of models, inflation is part of the electroweak epoch. The decay of the inflaton field flooded the universe with radiation and particles, as already mentioned. But this event is supremely important. Some of these particles were quarks and gluons, though the energies were too high for them to form larger particles. They formed themselves into a quark-gluon plasma. As I mentioned in my quark video, quarks are never found on their own, they're always found in particles with a neutral colour. However, in a quark-gluon plasma, quarks are found singly, on their own. Also, when particles are formed, they're never created on their own. They're always created in particle-antiparticle pairs. In the universe, particle pairs are created all the time, but they very quickly annihilate each other. 
And this is important because this particle creation at the very beginning of time had an ever so slight excess of matter over antimatter. And this is what gives rise to the observable universe that you and I are made of. Once the matter and antimatter had annihilated each other, there was a little bit of matter left over. Also, during this epoch, these particles haven't yet started interacting with the Higgs field. So they're currently massless, and thus travelling at the speed of light. At the end of the electroweak epoch, which happens at 10 to the minus 12 seconds, the temperature is decreased sufficiently for the electromagnetic and the weak forces to separate, and we're left with the four forces that we see today. We now enter the quark epoch, and this epoch will last until 10 to the minus 5 of a second. During this time, energies are still too high for larger particles to form, so the quark gluon plasma persists. But something very interesting does happen during the quark epoch. Well, at the start of it, really. At the start of the quark epoch, we get the beginnings of mass. At the start of the quark epoch, the temperature, well, energy, really, falls below 160 giga electron volts. And this is an important value. As I've already mentioned, the universe is pervaded by fields, and each field has a particle associated with it. In fact, particles are quantum fluctuations of those particular fields. One of these fields is called the Higgs field. At energies above 160 giga electron volts, the energy of the Higgs field is zero. This means that any particles interacting with the Higgs field would gain zero energy and thus be massless, because don't forget, energy and mass are kind of the same thing. However, strangely, at energies below 160 giga electron volts, the Higgs field is at its lowest energy when its energy is not zero. This means that particles interacting with the Higgs field will gain energy and thus have mass. That's very, very much a simplification, but gives the general idea. Maybe sometime in the future, I'll go into symmetry breaking in the Higgs mechanism, but not today. Besides, this is all breaking my very small brain. Our final epoch, which lasts from 10 to the minus 5 seconds to finish at about a second, is called the Hadron Epoch. During this time, the temperature had fallen to a mere trillion degrees. This is cool enough for quarks formed during the earlier epochs to associate themselves into particles called hadrons. Hadrons are particles made from quarks, and include mesons, formed from a quark and an antiquark pair, and baryons made up from three quarks, or three antiquarks. The matter and antimatter destroys itself, but there's an ever so slightly more matter than antimatter, and so once all the matter and antimatter have destroyed each other, there's a tiny bit of matter left over, and as I've already said, that's the matter that makes up the universe that we see today. Also during this time, protons and electrons are smashing into each other, this forms a neutron, and a neutrino is also given off. It's interesting to think that the protons that make up much of the atoms in your body were made here. I don't often do this, but if you're enjoying this video, then please consider subscribing by very gently pressing the subscribe button. Please don't smash anything. Well, that brings us up to the end of the first second. And even though I've described a lot of things happening, all the events that took place happened between two ticks of a clock. At the end of this time, the universe is still undergoing some massive changes and is about 20 light years in diameter. So is that it for the early universe? Well, not really. Our ideas of how this all happened change and modify as we learn new things. Some ideas suggest that inflation occurred before the hot big bang, and that's the limit of what we can extrapolate to. But whichever model of the early universe happens to be true, the early universe is certainly a strange place. But let's come back now to our time, more or less, and for now and until next time, thank you for watching.